Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome uh, to our first launch of 2022. Um, we're so excited uh, to be introducing Roger Stevens, who's a legend of children's poetry um, and been such a champion of poetry over the last 20 years. Um, his first book, his first solo book was actually, I learned today, published exactly 20 years ago. Um, and his amazing Poetry Zone website, which I hope we're going to hear more about, uh, was two years before that. Um, so this new collection gathers Roger's best love poems, the ones he knows teachers and children really love, the ones that work best in performance and on the page. Um, and I personally love the little notes that Roger writes after the poems to the children. Um, some of them are tips for performance and some of them are sort of personal anecdotes. I think that um, gives a lovely personal feel to the whole book. Um, in fact, I think that the, this whole book has a very personal feel to it, a real sort of one-to-one -one conversation of poet to reader. Um, and we at Otterbury Books, we're really proud to be publishing this retrospective um, of a, an important, very important children's poet, one of the most important children's poets working today. So just some quick thank yous. Thank you, Mike Smith, who I think is in the audience, our wonderful illustrator for the book. Um, your witty and inventive illustrations um, have been a joy and children are going to love them. And your cover uh, is superb too. Uh, and designer Steve Wells. Um, thank you to the Otterbury team, um, Gail, Sales, Katerina Wright, Jill in production, Judith, art director, Tatty and Laura on publicity. Um, and last but not least, thank you, Nikki Gamble, for hosting <laughs> again. Uh, a launch for us. Um, you are unsurpassed as an interviewer of authors um, and I know it's going to be a fascinating conversation. So over to you, Nikki. Thank you, thank you so much, Janetta. And thank you for those really kind words. I always think it's such an honour to be asked to do this, actually. So uh, the pleasure really is all mine. And can I just also extend Happy New Year to everyone we're still only two weeks into January, so I feel I can get away with that. Well, a few words first before we hear from Roger. What a delight when I opened up this wonderful, bright package that contained Roger's new collection of poems, Rasmataz. Not only does this vibrant, colorful cover capture the mood of the collection, it also reflects Roger's performance style. It's engaging, jazzy, and it's guaranteed to bring a smile to your face. I know that to be true because I've seen children and students instantly warm to Roger's inclusive humour. It's an inclusiveness that is extended to his support of fellow poets and aspiring poets. And I know that a lot of them have joined us this evening. And that really is a testament to your supportive um, approach, Roger. But my second delight is a personal one. When I was reading this book, it took me back to my nine-year-old self. I spent a good deal of my summer holidays with my grandparents who lived at the opposite end of the country to me. And although I enjoyed these visits, they could be quite lonely. The local children mimicked me with what they said was my posh accent, which is very odd because anyone born in Brixton in the 1960s didn't have a posh accent and I didn't talk the way that I talk today. But I was given this label because I was from London. Anyway, that's by the by. My dad would usually buy me a book for these holidays and often that would be a poetry book. Roger's book, when I read it, instantly took me back. It put me in mind of one of those collections that my dad bought for me. It was a book that I could read myself, that I could pick up, I could dip into, and importantly, the poems that were in it, I could read and reread. And because of them, they, uh, and because they didn't make too many demands on me in one sense as a reader, they became my friends. And I'm sure that this collection 
is going to serve as being a friend to many readers in a similar way. So tonight, Roger, and here he is in full regalia, I have to say. There we are. Here I am. Do you like hey. the shirt? Do you like the shirt? It's wonderful. I like the hat. I like the shirt. The guitar looks promising. Anyway, <laughs> you're going to be treating us by reading from the book today, and we're going to be chatting along the way too. Uh, we will be inviting questions from the audience, everyone, so please do use the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. By all means, chat to share thoughts with each other. But in terms of questions, I'll be picking them up from the Q&A, not from the chat. And we won't be using the raised hand either. So questions in Q&A. Um, well, without further ado, let's let's begin. And maybe the best place to begin is with you and poetry and how it all began. I wonder whether you can remember how you discovered how you enjoying poetry, whether it was listening to it, reading it, writing it. What did you discover first? Uh, I guess going back to um, secondary school and we did all the, we did Chaucer and um, Wordsworth and all, all the great poets, you know. And then I came across, and I'd been trying my hand at writing poetry, and I used to write a lot of fiction, well, I used to write fiction. Um, but then I came across um, the Mersey Poets and Roger McGough. And um, I guess that book really kind of opened the door, because you, I thought, you could write poems about anything. You don't have to write about, you know, life and death and, you know, all the big, big sort of themes of poetry. You could write about going to the chip shop or about your girlfriend. And I guess that was one of the one of the sort of ways that I became really got into poetry. And the other was Bob Dylan. Um, Listen to Bob Dylan and reading his lyrics. And it was the same thing, you know, though when you're used to all the music that we'd had up till then in the late, in the in the 50s, really, in the very early 60s, when Bob Dylan came along, it was like, whoa, it was just amazing. And I suppose as a musician, that sort of had a, had a, it, it infused me a lot as well. Mm -hmm. I've got a nice feeling of the circular event coming here because I know we're going to end by reflecting a little bit more on music and hearing some of your own music. So I'll hang on to the music questions just for a moment. Um, it sounds then that it came, that sounds like teenage years to me yes. when you discovered that. You don't recall poetry being read to you at school? Um, well... No, not really. I mean, we had poetry read to us and I used to enjoy it. And I used to, I mean, I used to read a lot of fiction. I think when I was seven or eight, my parents um, joined the, um, oh, I forget the name of it, the book club. I think it was Foyle's book club. It was a big book club. I mean, we came from a very working class background. Um, so it was quite a, a sort of forward thinking thing to do, really, to, to enroll me into a book club. So we, you get a, a new book every week, you get a Biggles or you get a, um, who was it, Malcolm Savile, you know, those books. And mm. so I was I was quite a ferocious reader, I guess. But po we had poetry at school, but it wasn't something that ever made me go like, oh, wow, mm. poetry. I mean, it was more fiction, really. When I, I, I got into writing poetry, should I talk a little bit about that? Yeah, do. Um, so I'd written, I'd written a lot of poetry for adults. We don't call it adult poetry. We call it poetry for grown-ups, you know, for obvious reasons. And so I'd written a lot of that through my teens and through my twenties and thirties. I'd written two adult novels or novels for grown-ups, I should say. Um, neither of which were published. I had a, a children's book published. I was teaching at a primary school. I started out in secondary schools, but I was teaching at a primary school. And for some reason, I have no idea why, I'd never thought about writing poetry for children. So I'd written a, a fiction 
book for children called The Howard that was published mm -hmm. by Penguin. I'd written lots of, you know, my own poetry, adult poetry, lots of, but I'd never really thought, hey, I'm in a primary school. Maybe I should write some poems for the children. Never crossed my mind. And then Brian Moses came to our school and he did a performance and he came to my classroom and he did a workshop. And I thought, oh, yes, that's what I should be doing. Um, because it was because he is fabulous and it was fabulous. Mm -hmm. And I went up to him after. And I said, Oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Moses, I write poems. And his face fell. Oh, another teacher, another hit. Oh. Um, but anyway, I sent him some poems and he published one, and then he published another. And that really got me going. It got me started. Mm -hmm. Turned out I was quite good at writing poetry for children. So mm -hmm. my sort of career then sort of veered off a little bit into that direction. I love that story of one person, you know, extending the hand and helping, helping somebody up, which is obviously, as we mentioned earlier, something that you've also done, extended that hand to people that are coming up. But let's get straight into this book, Razzmatazz. Great title, by the way. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this collection? Is it a collection of original poems or ones that you've collected from your favourites? Well, it's... Yes, it's all, it's a best of really. It's mainly poems from the first, I guess, 15 years or so. There's, there's a new poem, and one or two more modern poems. And there are a few poems garnered from um, different anthologies. But I guess probably, probably over half of them are from my, my solo collections. Um, and Part of the reason was, well, I just thought it would be really nice to get all these big, good poems that I like together. But the other reason is I, I go into lots of schools and I'd, would have, I'd have like a big pile of, you know, my poetry books. There is a big pile of them. And I'd be reading a poem from this book and a poem from that book. And at the end of the day, when I'm talking to children, they would say, oh, is the poem you read in, in that book? And I'd, and I'd say, oh, well, no, that's in a book that's out of print. I'm really, really sorry. And that used to happen a lot. And so in this book are, in fact, pretty much, well, the poems that I, I, I perform a lot, poems that are requested a lot, and plus some of just some of my favourite poems. Brilliant. So I think um, without further ado, it's time to hear some. And we're going to hear some funny poems to kick us off this evening. Tell us a bit about these and read them at your own pace as you wish <laughs> okay I, well i could read them very very fast or maybe i could do i know i do them normal i do them <laughs> okay so this is a sort of a, a modernish poem that i wrote for a book actually published by otter barry the same publisher um, um a book of poems all about it's called the waggiest tales it looks like that like the waggiest tales and this is a poem that I'm asked for a lot in this book. People seem to like it. It's called Secret. All the poems in this book were written by dogs, actually. Um, I wrote it with Bra Moses, funnily enough, talking about Bra Moses. We didn't really write the poems. We just basically, we translated them from the dog. Anyway, it's called Secret. You can bribe me with treats and biscuits and meats, but I'm not telling you where I buried it. You can yell, you can shout, you can stomp all about, but I'm not telling you where I buried it. You can stroke me and tickle me under my chin. You can say, just you wait till your mummy gets in. You can offer me caviar straight out the tin, but I'm not telling you where I buried it. It's my favourite toy. It's what gets my vote. I just love to chew it. It's what floats my boat. I don't know what it's for, but it's called a remote. But I'm not telling you where I buried it. <laughs> Great. Do you want to read another one from that section? And then we can no, have I mean, a chat. No, these are actually um, from the animals. This, the book is divided into sections. We thought that would be quite fun to do that. So the first section is a section of uh, 
school poems and well we'll talk about some of the sections um so this one is a very early poem that i wrote again this is when i discovered that dogs actually could write poems because this was written by our last dog judy who sadly is no longer with us it's called stick it might seem obvious to you humans but it puzzles me every day if you want the stick so badly why do you throw it away? <laughs> now you caught me there. I was trying to keep a straight face, but I couldn't. And Zaro's just put in the chat that she's laughed out loud as well. Just want to say many of the many of your poems are what would be called funny. And there's a well-known book chain. I'm not going to say the name of it. It's certainly used to group poems and jokes together. I'm not sure if it still does that. Uh, but it does seem to suggest that funny means slight and not important. Do you think that's a good place to find poetry? It's terrible, isn't it? Um, I don't know what, what letter the place you're thinking of begin with, but I think it's a letter towards the end of the alphabet, is it? Oh, I'm not saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, independent bookshops are brilliant, you know, but some of these big chains, I mean, this particular one, I've been into... To, I've been into this bookshop in very many places and the, and the children's books generally are on a bottom shelf somewhere with lots of joke books. You know, it, it, they really are kind of, oh, well, children's poetry was stick about one, which is terrible, really. I hope it's changed. Uh, it may well have changed, but it certainly used to be like that. And I just wonder, because it's only children's poetry, can you imagine putting Ted Hughes and T.S. Eliot in the humour section on the yeah, no. adult you, bookshop. You go into these bookshops, I mean, this one we're talking about with a, begins with a letter near the end of the alphabet. They have a lot of adult poetry. They have, like, shelves of it. I mean, huge shelves of it. And presumably, you know, um, children grow into adults. We want to get children motivated and enjoying poetry, don't we? And then they'll grow up from the book, from the shop's point of view. Let's educate the children, really get them enthused with poetry. They'll grow up and they'll buy all these fantastic adult mm. poems, but mm. they don't seem to work like that. The children do love poetry. You've only got to go into a school to see that. Children love it. Mm, absolutely. We've got some audience questions coming in. Do keep those coming in. I promise to pick them up as, as we go through. Uh, but while we're talking about funny poems... I want to ask you whether you write them to make yourself laugh or your readers and whether there's a difference. That's a good question, isn't it? Um, I write them. <laughs> well, they just, I don't know the answer. I don't know. <laughs> I think they just come out the way they come out, don't they? I mean, I have a notebook. I've got, I've got one of my notebooks in. I take my notebook everywhere I go and you get an idea don't you? you I write the idea down it might be a funny idea or it might be a serious one or a sad one and it's just the way the way things turn out. Mm. Occasionally if you're writing for a specific anthology so somebody uh, an, uh, a poet or an editor might be producing an anthology of of funny poems mm -hmm. then I guess you, you are consciously thinking oh would that be funny mm. but generally you just write the poems that that you write mm -hmm. um i do laugh at my own poems which is i don't know if that's good or just a bit sad i think that's good i think that's good it's interesting because not, funny doesn't know. mean that it can't be sad as well at the same time does it of course not no i mean i did laugh quite loudly at just something i thought of when i was getting onto the tube a couple of years ago pre-covid obviously i just thought of this little idea for a poem and I laughed out loud and then I realised that I was in a public place. I wasn't even reading a book, just... <laughs> oh, sorry, very sorry. <laughs> well, I want to ask you, um, because the, the, your poems work so well when you read them aloud and you perform them, uh, and funny poems are particularly good. You know, you get the tone of voice just right, you know, when you read them aloud. You are a superb performer of your own work. Well, if you can't do it, nobody else can, can they? Um, 
so what I wanted to know, I, I, I was going to say, you also put together a collection called Off by Heart, I seem to remember. That's all about learning and performing poem. We've got lots of teachers in the audience this evening. What top tips do you have for children and their teachers to help them develop confidence with performance? Uh, confidence with performance? Uh, well, again, I don't know. I think it's just practice, isn't it? And experience is just if you give children lots of uh, opportunities to read aloud, um, some children, of course, uh, don't like to do that. But uh, the, but the more children do do that, they better they get the better they get at doing it. Um, for teachers watching, I did um, a residency at a school in Basildon, and uh, we had to put on a, a, put on a show. So, so we had a, I think it was lasted for a term. And at the end, we were working towards a show, which would be the children reading poems. And I, what I did was to, to, I gathered all the children around, you know, like you do it in practice. It was a year, it was a year four class. And I just um, said, any suggestions how we can make this really interesting? And it was fantastic. And I wrote the ideas on the board. They just came up with idea after idea after idea. We could dress up. We could we could have music with it. We could do group poems. We could do this. We could do that. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, and that's something definitely worth trying. If, if you involve the children, if you know, don't just say, "Oh, read it nice and loud and really nice and clearly." Um, Great, a great suggestion, actually. Yeah. And we could also direct people to look at the Clipper Award, which obviously has that element yeah. of performance That's to it, which is great, That's isn't it? Yeah. Now, we heard at the beginning that you were a teacher, a secondary teacher and a primary teacher. And you have a section in your book called The World of School. So mm. I'd love to hear some of those. OK, it's the section that opens the book. Uh, yes, that opens the book. Um, what shall I read? I'll read. Uh, oh, I'll read. These are a couple of short ones. This is called Teacher, Teacher. This is a, a, another little funny poem. I thought it was good to start the book with some, you know, funny poems. Teacher, Teacher. If you can't find Sue, she's in the cloakroom looking for her shoe. Teacher, Teacher. If you can't find Ben, he's in with her head because he's late again. Teacher, teacher, if you can't find Hans, he's still in the shower because he's lost his pants. <laughs> At this point, I would just like to say that I'm not a big fan of poetry books that have lots of references to poo, pants and farts. Um, however, the odd one or two might, you know, if it creeps in, is fine. You um, had a little note attached to that poem, didn't you? What's the, what's yeah. the little note there? It says, you might be very surprised to know how many odd things as a teacher I found left behind in showers and swimming pools, including shoes, trousers, and yes, pants. I know the teachers will be sympathising yeah. with you. And you wonder, you know, like one shoe, I've lost one of my shoes. What do you mean? What do you, you've lost Asian? No, I don't find it. Go figure. This is um, this is called. Um, I wrote a, a sort of follow up to that that I often read really for the teachers because I think it goes a little bit over some children's heads. This is the alternative version. Teacher, teacher, Millicent Wit has hidden the hamster in her PE kit. Teacher, teacher. Jeremy Pear has hidden Beth's socks and he won't tell her where. Teacher, teacher, Alistair Tupp says these rhymes are contrived and the names are made up. <laughs> you didn't make a name up just so that you could get the rhyme in, did you, Roger? Yeah, I'm afraid I might have done. I'll just <laughs> read this one more from this section because this is, this is one of my favourite poems. Um, I just thought it would be a great idea to try to find how many words that were the same um, uh, that I could fit together to make sense. It's called corrections. Teacher said, leave out the the. Two twos, one two, too many. 
and and after the comma should go after the any. The, the, the to and move the and and that should make it flow. Not that, 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 that's fine. But this, that, that could go. I said, the, 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 to, the, and, I would agree with you, but I'm very fond of that, this, that, and that, that, too. Which that is that? Is that this, that? <laughs> Asked teacher with a grin. Okay, but take that last in out and leave that last, and leave that last out in. <laughs> It's appreciation coming through on the chat for corrections. Now, you strongly believe in uh, the value of having poetry in schools. Why, why is it so important? Oh, well, I, yeah, well, it is important. I think for, for very many reasons, I think, firstly, it is part of our literary heritage, isn't it? So uh, I think poetry is a good thing. And we need to promote it and sort of keep it going and grow those adults that we were talking about that goes go to the shop um, with the letter near the end of the alphabet to buy adult poetry books. So that's that's one reason. The second reason is um, uh, a poem is like a package, isn't it, of, of all sorts of different things. Um, and you, so it's a tool you can use it in schools. You can use it to teach. If you've got to teach similes or metaphors or adjectives you know you'll find poems that are bound with those things and you can write poems with children you could get children to write a poem using adjectives it's a brilliant brilliant way of teaching all that stuff you know in a way that is fun and will motivate the children and help them learn it so i think that's very important also it is the children that have the find difficulty with reading, mm -hmm. um, it's small, isn't it? A poem is just a very small thing. A haiku has got three lines, you know, so it really is useful um, for children that, 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 that have trouble with, with reading and with processing words mm -hmm. and information. Mm -hmm. I, I taught it, as, I, well, I, I, was, I was at a school once and we did, um, and it was quite a, a school, I would say, with children had a lot of challenges. Uh, and we did, uh, I did a session on haiku poems and short poems. And uh, there were a couple of the boys there. and They absolutely flew with this. I mean, we were doing haikus having 17 syllables, which they don't have to have, but that's, that's how we were doing it. And um, they were just really, really into it because it was maths. They, you know, oh, look, well, well, da, 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 da. or we could count it. You know, and afterwards the teacher said that was brilliant because he had not got those children, those boys interested in any kind of reading or poetry at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is, poetry is just such a, such a useful tool and such a, a great thing as well. Finding the way in. I'm yeah. going to go to some of these audience questions that have started coming into the Q&A. So we'll just have a bit, a bit of a break while we um, have a look at these. So Kelly Marshall uh, says she's currently teaching classic poetry with her year six group and recently discussed what classic poetry means. She wants to know what it means to you and do you have a favourite classic poem? That's a nice, easy question. <laughs> um, well, I think it doesn't... Eh, I, th I don't think it sort of means anything to me, particularly over contemporary poetry, uh, but I do, I do love classical poetry. I do have a lot of favourites. Um, at school, I remember coming across... Oh, I can't even remember who wrote it. Ozymandias. Uh, Tennyson, was it Tennyson? Shelley. Shelley wrote it. I was it? What a brilliant! I mean, we did have a, a fantastic uh, English teacher at secondary school, and he did make poetry really, really come to life. And we had to study it for O levels. It was then. I think we did Chaucer and, um, but yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I've got any tips, any tips for teachers teaching classical poetry. I guess it's the thing. It's just getting children enthused with it, really. 
if you know if you could get them excited about it and it is very interesting structures of of, of classical poetry not a very good answer i'm afraid but just just interesting that the poets that you've referred to there are what might be called and of course that is the great thing about poetry in some ways it's ageless you yes. know we can all read ozymandias and get different things from it at different ages and the same with william blake you know you can respond to it as a five-year-old and you, you know your rose might be very literally a rose with a worm in it or whatever but you didn't mention any classic children's poetry oh that's interesting isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> well yeah I would, yeah, I am trying to think of classic children's poetry that I really, really like. Now, nothing springs to mind. I was never really a fan, and this is going to be heresy, but I was never really a fan of Robert Louis Stevenson's poetry. <laughs> um, I always felt, I loved his, his adventure stories. I mean, mm. Treasure Island. I reread Treasure Island a few years ago. And it's still quite, it's still fresh. It's still, even though the language is slightly archaic, it still, it still has pace. It's still very fresh. But I always felt, felt his children's poems were a bit, I always felt he was sort of writing them down a little bit to the children. Mm. Oh, well, like your children, you know. So no, mm. the, none, none really spring to mind. Sorry. Okay, that's your heresy. My heresy is that, I think Ted Hughes did that with his children's poetry. Much better writing, fact, in my opinion. Sorry, all you poets out there, I might have really offended somebody. Anyway, let's get on to a couple of other questions, first of all. Um, somebody wants to know about your serious poems, but we're going to come on to that. But there is a second part to this question. Um, why don't you like relying on bottoms and pants? Why? Because mm. I, think, I think it's easy. I think it's just... It's just a cop out, really. You, you could go into a class, you know, and you could say the word poo, and everybody would laugh, you know. And it's uh, it's kind of a bit easy, and mm -hmm. I think it becomes a bit wearing too after a while. Yeah. You, you know, it's it's like I don't know if older people amongst the audience here will remember this, but there was, but stand up comedy went through a bit of a change in the in the sort of Eight, early 80s um, and it changed from telling jokes to observational comedy and suddenly saying the F word was the thing uh, and, and everywhere you went every comedian was using the F word to get a laugh mm. and I just thought you know it's just it's a cop out isn't it really yeah really um, interesting and on the, on, we've, I've put a thing on, on the poetry zone which were but we may talk about in a bit um, that any children sending poetry with a word with farts and poos and bottoms in, I won't publish it. Now, I also say that I think some poems with poos and bottoms can be very funny. I don't, you know, I'm not anti them, just, you know, I don't hate them or anything. I mean, I've, I've written poems like that myself and they can be very funny, but Children sending poets in, poems in, every other poem is, is about poo, uh, you know, and you think, eh, you know, let's mm. try and do, let's try and elevate things a little bit more. Yeah. Let's try and do something a little bit better. One more audience question, then we'll go to some more poems. Hazel Jones wants to know whether you've ever translated any hamster poetry. I'm guessing you know what that means. Hamster poetry, I've got no idea what it means. Except I have to know that uh, Hazel does have a bit of a thing about hamsters. Um, she wears a hamster, well, a fake hamster, a fake, I have to say, hamster coat. And uh, she trains hamsters. And we've often discussed the fact that there aren't really enough hamster poems around. So I haven't written a lot of hamster poems. A couple nearly made it into this book, but. At the last minute, they got replaced by other poems. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Hazel. <laughs> we'll come back to the other questions and do keep putting those into uh, the Q&A. Uh, but I want to have a quick, uh, I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. So I just want to give a call out to the wonderful um, Mike Smith's illustration. And what a great, can you see that, Roger? 
Yes. Okay, let me just put it full screen from me for you. Ah, uh, there we go. That's nice and big now. What a fantastic uh, job he did with the cover. And of course, there's some illustrations inside as well. Um, how do you think the illustration enhances the reading experience? Um, well, as a general rule, um, I think, yeah, I'm not really sure how to answer that, really. I think, I think if the illustrations can add to the poem and to the enjoyment of the poem, and I think if it's a book for children, poems need a bit of room to breathe, so they need space around them. And I think illustrations help give the book as a whole, you know, a, a sort of a friendly kind of feel. And I think a good illustrator could, could bring things out that extra things maybe that maybe even weren't in the poems, but that will, will help, that will, will enhance the poems readers will think oh yeah I hadn't thought about that oh yeah that's a good idea you know mm -hmm. and I think Mike does that in, in this book there are a lot of really lovely illustrators in the book that sort of take it a little bit further can you give us a couple of examples well he's 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 managed to insert a joke of his own into the book which um I think I really really like actually I think it's very funny I'll just see if I can find it here I'll show you it um, you'll have to come back to me for it. Yeah, I'm just going to take the share off and then we can see it. Yeah. Um, where is it here? You'll have to bear with Oh, here it is. Um, it's called ha More Haiku Style Fun. And in fact, uh, one of the poems on this page was the first poem I ever had published. It was a haiku poem. I'll read the poem. When I write haiku, I always seem to have one syllable left O. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, so his illustration is this. Look. Oh, yeah. So he's taken a little, he's played, has done a little play on words there for the illustration. Brilliant. Which, it's very, very funny. And yeah, they're lovely, the illustrations. Um, this is a good one. This is called Chutney, this poem. 16 jars of tomato chutney sit in the cupboard chuckling. <laughs> this, this is his illustration. Probably, oh. It's possibly better than the poem. <laughs> it's lovely, isn't it? Who put the dialogue in there? What's so funny? Was that he did, he no, he did he that did. as well? Yeah, he, he has a liking, I think, for cartoons and for comics, I should say, mm. really, all the cartoons. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, there are some lovely ones. Some, some of the poems in the collection are actually... Oh, oh, look. It's good, isn't it? Very expressive. <laughs> some of the poems in, in this collection are about being a poet, aren't they? Yes. Tell us about some of those or read us some. <clears throat> So when I was sorting out, the, choosing the poems, um, I realised that I'd written a lot of poems about uh, being a poet. Uh, so, yeah, I could read a couple. Uh, let's see, page 69. So if you're following this in your books, it's page 69. 68, 69. Yeah, so... Uh, this, I wasn't going to read this poem because this poem actually works better with an audience. So I don't know how it will work on Zoom. Um, but this is probably my most requested poem. And had I known that it was going to be my most requested poem, I would have taken a lot more care with it, I have to say. I'll just say that. Who says a poem always has to rhyme? There was a young man called Frank who kept his pocket money in the bank post office. Can I be, I'll be the audience, okay? okay. <laughs> when he saves enough, he bought an electric viola and celebrated with a can of co- Coca-Cola. Canut cordial. When he plays the viola, the whole house rocks. It makes your shoes dance and it frightens your... Oh! Go 
on, tell me. Granny. <laughs> Frank plays his viola all of the time. Who says a poem always has to rhyme? Have the same sound at the end of the line as it had at the end of the line before. <laughs> yes, yeah. and there's a few poems like that that sort of play around with it, play around with that idea. I quite like this one. This is, uh, I thought I'd write one in, in the style of Picasso. It is sort of mid to late period. I didn't know he wrote poetry. He didn't. This is, <laughs> this is me writing a poem in the style of his art. Yeah, I knew that. I know you did. <laughs> oh, no, you knew. It's got Gherkin Carr. I am the Picasso of poetry. Ear, nose, blue, pink eye spoon. Burnt ochre, sienna, five plums a tenner. A six-year-old child could write this. Exclamation mark, wonky donkey, Bob. <laughs> Don't you just hate this? A six-year-old could write this. If only they knew. <laughs> only they knew. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask you, because I, I know that you um, have been running this website, Poetry Zone, for a long time, which um, supports children writing poetry. Tell us a bit about that. Is it still available? Can teachers use it? Yes, it's uh, www.poetryzone.co.uk. And going back to 1998, I just, I was sort of in the, the, the transition from uh, being a teacher. I'd left teaching full time. I was still doing a little bit of supply teaching uh, because you can't just suddenly become a writer. You don't suddenly get money. Um, and so I was starting to get poems published. I was starting to visit schools. And I realized that there was nowhere that children could get their poems published or seen or appreciated by any sort of audience other than, I don't know, their family or their granny or their class or their school. So I thought it would be great to start up a website publishing children's poetry. So basically that's what I did. Um, I found um, a, a proper kosher web designer. He designed it all for me. It's still basically the same website as it was then. It's been updated by my nephew, who is, you know, a lot younger than me and therefore much better at doing that sort of thing. Um, and basically it's a place where children can publish their poems. I edit all the poems. Um, it is a bit of a labour of love, really, because it does take time. But I treat the poems as they would be treated if they'd been sent to a proper publisher or a book publisher. Uh, they were going to be published in a book. They will be edited. And so I edit the poems, uh, which does take a while. I take I get no money from it because I really hate advertising for children just as a general thing. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's been going for, well, it's been going for 20, 22. I, I'm not very good at maths, but it's been going for nearly... A long time. Yeah, it's, it's a long time. Years, actually, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it, 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 it reached... We were getting sort of like a million hits a month. We were getting big, big figures in the, in the first few years because there was really nothing else out there like it. Now there are lots of blogs and children's sites and children's websites. So it's yeah. much easier for children to get their stuff out there. But it's still going strong. We run competitions. We review latest children's poetry books. And there is a, a resource that there for teachers as well. And Excellent. an archive of children's poetry um, that is very useful if you're, te if you're teaching like haiku poems or you're teaching, uh, you know, personification or or whatever you will there there are several sections there and you could probably find some children's poems um, that 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 would work really well as, as part of your teaching of that great so hopefully if anybody hasn't discovered it they'll hop along yeah, there although we have got uh, comments coming up in in the chat saying how how you know children just felt so inspired to see their own poetry um, online. So it's really lovely 
uh, to, to hear that. And you've also got the rogues gallery of everybody who writes children's poetry up there as well. So uh, it's a good, good resource from that point of view and all the interviews that you've got with people. Um, let's get serious, Roger. We've got, we've got about 15 minutes left and we've just been having too much of a laugh. So um, I too was much. asked too to ask you about your serious oh. poems. Yeah. Sorry? I was asked to ask you about your serious poems. Oh, okay, well, go on then. But, go on, tell us about your serious <laughs> poems and read us one. Okay, Look, I'm we're... reading them. Well, um, when I visit schools, I do tend to do a lot of, of, of funny poems and joining in poems because my mission, well, I think when I visit a school is to motivate children and get them really, really excited. Um, and I read one or two serious poems, maybe a couple of sad ones when I'm at schools as well. Um, but I write, I think as most writers do, I don't just sit writing funny poems all day. A lot of the stuff that I write is quite serious and quite sad. And I think in my books, there is probably a lot more serious and uh, poetry rather than the, the, the just sort of funny stuff. I'll read you one or two. Um, I often read poems about death. Um, lots of children, you know, when you're a child, you lose a pet. Children lose pets, don't they? It, it is like, well, for adults too, losing a pet is, I mean, you grieve, don't you? It's like a terrible, terrible experience. And children lose um, uh, grandparents and, and, and parents sometimes. Um, and so I, I've got one or two poems that deal with that sort of thing. Um, I'll read you a couple. This is, I've got to find it. Oh, I've made a note of it somewhere because I'm very organized. Um, it's just, there are so many notes. <laughs> um, uh, it would be here somewhere. Oh, well that's for, oh here it's page 49. One page away from where I am. So I wrote this one for, uh, for our dog, um, Judy. Judy was the dog, she was a, a border collie, and she was the one that showed me that, that dogs could write poems, in fact. Um, and it's called Hole. There is a hole in the space around me. You can't see it, but it goes everywhere with me. It's border collie shaped, and it doesn't come when it's cool, for it's a hole, it's empty, and it's not called Judy. I did have a deep sigh when I read that one. There's something about that border collie shaped hole, very sad. I, and I, what I say to children is, I, I usually preface a poem like that by saying that when, say, a pet dies or a member of the family dies, it really is like the saddest thing. And sometimes writing about it is, is a way for you to sort of express some of your grief or some of your emotion about it. So it's, it, it can, I don't use the word cathartic or maybe mm -hmm. I should, but it is, you know, it, it's a good thing to do. And I think for some children, they find, oh, we're allowed to write about it. So they don't have, you know, it's difficult to talk about something like that, isn't it? Um, and especially children don't necessarily have, um, they haven't, they don't yet have the experience or the, the, the language that they will need maybe when they're grown ups to talk about that sort of thing. Um, and, but the second thing is, um, when you look back on it, you know, five years later, or, you know, when you were grown up, you know, it's like a little memory too, isn't it? It's like a little photograph and you think, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember that was lovely, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. Really nice idea. And I think um, just listening to you speak there, it reminds me how important it is that children have opportunities to write freely so that we're not always constraining the subject of their poetry or focusing always on the form of poetry. Because yeah. unless we give them the spaces, that kind of thing won't come out. Yeah, yeah. There's also um, really, uh, there's an interesting book, or a lovely book that you may well have come across by Sharon Creech called Love That Dog. Oh, yes. No, yeah. Which is along those lines, isn't it? A teacher that understands that writing 
is cathartic uh, yeah. for, for the child. I've just, just read a note down here by Kelly uh, talking about that. And it's, it's no, it's, you know, adults generally are very nervous around poetry. Um, I don't know if anybody saw Pointless um, two nights ago, <laughs> but they had three, three different questions with poetry in the question, somewhere in the, you know, somewhere in the question. And uh, Zander, as we Pointless fans call him, and Richard Osmond actually spent probably two minutes of air time saying that um, their generation somehow missed out on poetry and that they really ought to try and read more poetry. You know, mm. and I, I applauded. Well, well done. I don't think they heard me because... Because <laughs> no, you're in France. Well, no, we're in France and, it's, <laughs> and the, the programme's recorded as well. So, But, you know, I just thought, well, good for you, you know. Um, and it's no, it's, you know, what are the best-selling poetry books for adults? Poems to read at funerals, poems to read at weddings, at big occasions. Mm. They're the books, aren't they? That everybody, you know, you turn to a poem, don't you, when somebody dies? Mm. got a couple of audience questions I don't want to lose them because I can see that we're we've only got about nine minutes left and a few other things that we want to explore uh but Joshua Siegel has asked who your favorite poets are writing for grown-ups okay well my favorite poet writer for grown-ups was my favorite poet when I was a uh, teenager and that is Roger McGough oh yeah and Roger McGough's poems, they do the thing that I really like poems to do, whether they're for adults or children. And that is to be accessible, easy to read. You read the poem, there it is. Oh yeah, I've read that, I can understand it. But also to have another level to it that, that you can think about and sometimes think, oh, actually, Oh, yeah, there's a, it's a bit more to it than that. And Roger McGough does that absolutely brilliantly. Mm. You know, a lot of his poems, he does write quite flippant, funny poems, but he writes a lot of lovely, lovely, quite serious, but quite witty at the same time mm. poetry. So I love Roger McGough. I like, there's an American writer called Billy Collins. And I don't know if you've come across Billy Collins, but again, very, very accessible poetry, but it's absolutely lovely. And he does a live poetry uh, session. If you look him up somewhere on Facebook, mm. um, I think pr practically every day, he's absolutely brilliant. Mm. And I like Carol Ann Duffy. Mm. Um, I like, um, yeah, there are loads and loads of poems. Carol Ann Duffy's written some absolutely wonderful poems as well. Mm. I mean, there are lots of them. Look, sitting on my desk next to yours. Ah. There you are. There you, go. there you go. I love Roger's Defying Gravity. That is such a moving uh, collection, I think, of poems. Yeah. Um, and Joshua's just come back with a quick to say he thinks all people that have the name Roger write good poetry. He's a very just... nice, he's a very nice man, isn't he? Oh, yeah. They, <laughs> it's just one of those crazy things, isn't it? Just one of those crazy facts. Let's just have this question from Michaela and then I'll move on to thinking a little bit about music to, to bring us all together at the end. So Michaela Morgan says, I find myself reminding teachers to use poetry in their classrooms. Poetry can get overlooked. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I said earlier about it being a very useful tool if you're teaching uh, adjectives or similes, but also... Um, if you're teaching history or if you're teaching geography, you know, it, there, there are so many poems that bring in all sorts of different things. You know, there are actually books of nothing but uh, history poems. There's one I could think of right now. In fact, there's one that I wrote with Brown Moses called uh, 1066. It's got 1066 in the title. Obviously, I know it very, very well. But <laughs> it's a whole book of of, of of history poems and a book, a game that I wrote with Brad about with war poems, but what are we fighting for? Poems um, about World War I, World War II and modern warfare, um, not too heavy. It was difficult to write because it's, a, it's quite a heavy subject, but yeah, you could use poetry. If you, whatever you're teaching, you can find it 
coming from it, you know, you could come mm. to it, you could come to different subjects through poetry from all sorts of odd and mm. fantastic ways. I mean, one of the bits of advice that I sometimes give to teachers, they might not be looking for it, but I give it anyway, yeah, yeah. is have yeah. a really good anthology that you really like, you know, put together by a good anthologist. It will become your best friend as a teacher because you can whip it out at any time when you, you, you know, you've got not that they have many spare minutes, but it's there and you can get to know those poems really well. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a book. There's a book by Garrison Keeler. He's American. He wrote uh, Lake Wobegon. Uh, it's a big, thick anthology of mainly American, but not just American poems. And it is a real, there's a real wide range of poems. It's a brilliant, brilliant anthology. And also coming back to that question earlier about classical poems, you know, you don't only have to read um, children's poetry to children. Yeah. You know, you know, there is lots of good adult poetry that children will understand and will love. And the main thing is, to, if you're a teacher, is to just get into poetry a bit yourself. Try reading some poems. Have a poetry book by your side so children can see, oh, our teacher reads poems. Oh, maybe that's a good idea. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to come on to our final uh, questions now. And just so that the audience know what we're going to do, we're going to be playing out our event this evening uh, in a little while uh, with some of Roger's music. And we're going to be playing out with a song co to, called To Write a Good Song. So when that music comes on, you'll know that we're at the end of our event. I will leave the chat on for a little while in case you have any parting thoughts, comments or questions uh, for Roger. Um, but before we get to the music itself, um, I'm interested to know, Roger, whether music and poetry inform each other. Yes, they do. Um, there's a lot of, of song lyrics. I think probably most song lyrics need the music to go with them. I think. I think that is true. And a lot of poetry, I don't think you could just put to turn into a song. But if you look at somebody like Bob Dylan and his lyrics, you know, you can read them. Most of his stuff, you could just read as lyrics. In fact, I've written a whole book of my song lyrics, not published by Otter Barry, but I just, we'll just mention it. These are all the lyrics of my song. And we talk about that. So yes, um, I think lyrics, can be read as poetry, but usually you do need the music and the poetry to go with it. So here's a follow-up question to you. Okay. Do you ever find yourself putting your own poems to music in your head? Even if they're not songs, do you find yourself doing that? Um, not, not so much, no, except that very often, especially if I'm walking, if I'm walking the dog, for example, um, when you're thinking of ideas and of poems, very often they, they come into your head in a quite a rhythmic way. So, and sometimes you think of songs, songs very often come, come in as, as words. It's a, I don't know, I don't like, like most of your questions, Nikki, I don't know the answer. <laughs> It's a magic We've had a, writing, being a I, writer. I tell you what, you've had a pretty good stab at them, though. <laughs> yeah, well, I will do that. I can talk for another hour. <laughs> sadly, sadly, we don't have another hour. But it has been great uh, being able to have a conversation with you. Maybe we'll have one last poem and then the song. That would be good, okay. wouldn't it? Um, I don't know which one. To, I'm going to read this one, which I quite... I don't know, I quite like this poem. It's called Escape Plan. As I, Stegosaurus, stand motionless in the Natural History Museum, I am secretly planning my escape. At noon, Pterodactyl will cause a diversion by wheeling around the museum's high ceilings and diving at the curators and museum staff, while I, quietly slip out of the fire exit and melt into the Kensington crowds. Mm, thank you so much, Roger. Now on to Pleasure. write Pleasure. a good song. Thank Although you I've much. lost it. <laughs> I just want to say, Typical. 
can I just say thank you everybody for, for turning up and thanks for all your support. I mean, you mentioned earlier about poems supporting one another and children's poetry and children's fiction too come to that. It's a very, they're very supportive people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd like to thank everybody there that has supported me and editors and poets and all that, but mainly all of you, all of you good folk out there. And uh, thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Janetta. For thank you both me. let me try and find this we can turn our cameras off people can listen to the music and uh i'm going to try to find it but i may not be able to which is annoying <laughs> it was there earlier of course it was i'll have it <laughs> hmm.